Good morning. I guess it's still kind of morning, right? For some of you, probably very early morning, right? <laughs> 10.30. I understand that. All right, started a little bit about Eric pointed out that I made a bit of a mistake on the, uh, on the assignment description for part one. Uh, I'm going to update it so the types are 0, 1, and 2. So that way I don't have to change anything about the grading infrastructure. So it should be a small, easy change. Yes. Cool. Uh, any, well, we're going to get into stuff. So we're going to save any assignment two questions will be answered by Sai on Wednesday. Sai, you want to raise your hands in the corner? Uh, so I'm not going to be here on Wednesday. I'm going to record a lecture for you so we can continue with this uh, awesome application insecurity topic. And then Sai will hold the in-class discussion section. So bring all your questions on the assignments. Bring it on Wednesday. He'll talk about it. And you can have a cool, good discussion. So yeah, you can also tell him what you want covered or if there's anything specific you want to see. I think he's totally willing to do that. So. All right, then let's get into it. OK, so we are talking about applications, and we're talking specifically about, uh, about lights. So we were talking about compilation, right? So we're trying to understand the process by which our application actually gets executed by the CPU, right? So we looked at, okay, so we have a language written in a high level language like C or whatever. And so we've seen that the, uh, that the compiler, right, will first compile that program to assembly, where the assembler will compile that to a binary object. And the linker's job is then to take all the binary objects, link up all the references, and create an executable file. Right? So we have our linker. And we talked about the differences between static linking. So static linking is done at compile time. So any libraries that are statically linked are included in your binary. Uh, whereas dynamic linking flags are set on your executable that says, hey, at runtime, I'm going to use the libc library, and I'm going to call the printf function and these other functions. So load those up at runtime. And so we talked about the common executable formats, uh, elf and pe. So now we're going to dig into what are these actual files. So what does it mean, the executable format? This common executable format. What do I mean? Yeah. Yeah, this would be the kind of the layout of a binary file that's produced is common. Exactly. Yeah. So when you on Linux, when you compile using GCC a program, right, if you don't give it an output name, it'll output a dot out. So the question is, what is the structure of that file? Right? We kind of already talked about, I believe on Friday, that it's not just x86 binary. Right, the operating system just doesn't just start executing it, right? There's additional metadata about that file that the operating system needs. So that's what the ELF is a file format, and PE for Windows is a file format. So this is kind of an important distinction in your mind when you see an executable on Windows, or I mean on Linux, right? So that you know, hey, this isn't just binary code, right? This is actually a file format. That tells the operating system how to load and execute this binary code. So ELF is a great name. I actually love it. Uh, a lot of cool puns that you can do with papers about this kind of stuff. Um, so it stands for the Executable and Linkable Format, which is actually kind of a boring name, but with a good acronym. So this is how you should name things, by the way. Um, so it's. Uh, incredibly well used. One of the important things is the file format itself is architecture independent. What does it mean, architecture independent? x86, x64, and Yeah, doesn't matter. ARM bits, x86, x64. The file structure is the same, right? Whatever the binary ends up being, maybe the binary code may be different for different processors, but it's architecture independent. Uh, so there are, at a high level, there's four types of ELF files. 
So they can either be relocatable files, which means that the linker, right, the linker hasn't done any, a job on this, so this code uh, needs to be, is able to be relocated to any address so that it can be linked together with other object files. So when you compile something with a .c, the .o file, that binary object is gonna be a relocatable elf file. Is this executable? No, right, the keyword is fixed, right? So it, this code doesn't live anywhere yet. It doesn't have a specific address that it's gonna be executing at, but it has all the information needed for a linker to put it wherever it wants to go. So executable is kind of the one we're probably most familiar with, right? So all symbols have it resolved, except for symbols that are used by shared libraries. So the dynamic, dynamic linking process If you execute like a specifically a .so file, a .so file is a shared library, so this means that it has information about what symbols it exports and how to call it at runtime and load it, so this is another type of ELF format. Uh, and finally, the fourth one's kind of weird, um, a core dump. So when you're, pro what's a core dump for? What was it? Segmentation. Say again, louder. Segmentation part. Yeah, so when your program terminates or seg faults is probably when you've seen it. It creates a core dump, which is a memory, uh, the dump of the code and memory of your program at that point. So that way you can debug it, so you can see where your code is executing and what happened. Uh, very handy tools. So read elf is a very cool tool that parses an elf file and tells you information about the structure of that file. Uh, what's the file command? There's a file called a file on your link. Yeah. Use the file type, file type. How does it determine file type? What does that mean? Uh, it reads the first four type, first four bytes, first byte, and it determines the file. Yeah, so maybe not necessarily the first four bytes, yeah. right? Yeah. But what file does, right? So all the data on your program, including ELF files and every other type of file, right? It's just bits on your hard drive, mm -hmm. right? So oftentimes programs want to know. Hey, is this a JPEG? Is this an ELF file? Is this a whatever? In Windows, you often have the suffix that tells you kind of what the program should be, but on Linux, there's no restriction like that. So oftentimes, they include magic bytes at the beginning that says, okay, every JPEG file will start with a GPG. I actually don't know if that's true. I can't remember exactly what it is, but uh, if it's a valid JPEG file, valid JPEG files will start with these three bytes or four bytes. And so the file command basically has this whole database of all of these files and these magic numbers. So it can look at a file and say, okay, based on the magic number, this looks like an ELF file. Or based on the magic number, this looks like a zip file or whatever that file format is. Okay, so now we can dig into more into the ELF file format. I can see I messed up a little bit here. Uh, that's fine. So first, at a high level, we have head, the header, and the header specifies information about, special information about the ELF file. After that, we have what's known as the, the program header table, which is basically a table that's gonna tell us about other parts, where to find more information about the parts of the program. Uh, we have actual segments, uh, then sections, and then we have a section header table which describes all the sections in our ELF file. And so the idea here is these segments and sections depend on what type of file it is. So the loader C is a collection of segments and a collection of sections, right, depending on what it needs. So segments are multiple sections and the idea is that these header files describe the structure. Um, and important information is also in the header. So there is a ELF magic number. Uh, it's not exactly ELF, it's a four bytes. I think the first byte is one, uh, I'm not exactly 100% sure, uh, but that's fine, you can look it up. It's very, very easy to tell. Um, after that, there is the addressing info, which says uh, this 
specifies the size of addresses in the ELF file. Are they 32-bit addresses or 64-bit addresses? So why is this information important? Because it's architecture. It's architecture independent? Yes. <coughs> but how does this help us? Why is it the second byte in the header? So what's the big difference between 32-bit and 64-bit? What about memory? says is, hey, put this segment at this specific memory location, right? I need to know if it's 32 bits versus 64 bits. Because if I think I'm parsing a 32-bit address, but really it's 64, I'm going to mess everything up. And so that's why it's the first, you know, one of the first files here, or sorry, files, uh, one of the first header elements here so that you can know when you see an address later what the exact size is going to be. Uh, we have a byte here for the uh, file type, which says, I believe this specifies the endianness of the file, if it's little endian or big endian. Uh, it then has more details about the specific architecture type. Is it x86? Is it MIPS? Is it ARM? Right? You can have ARM that's 32 bits, which is going to be still the addressing info will say it's 32 bits, right? but the architecture is ARM and not x86, even though the same structure. The entry point, what's, what does it mean, the entry point of a program? The start of the yeah, the start. Where, right? So this is, now we get to like the very critical component of the binary, right? This is the important metadata that tells the operating system where to start executing this, this binary from, right? So this is an address that specifies the en entry point. And then we have an offset that says where to read the program header, and an offset that says to read where to read the section header, and the size of this header, and then an entry that says the size and number of program headers, so that you can read this program header table, right? If you don't know, if you don't know the size, that'll be a problem. And then uh, the size and number of entries in the section header file. So the idea is each of these segments are either going to be code or data. We don't actually know. But the segment header table specifies all the information that says, OK, segment 0 should be put at address 08001, and it's executable. And then segment 2 should be located at 0x10, and it's data, it's read-only data. Um, so we can see that, so uh, I'll show you an example in a second. So the idea is each section that header specifies the type of the section and the permissions. Um, so what does it mean permissions? Why is that? Why are we talking about permissions? Is it like readable or executable? Yeah, right, so, so this is actually, uh, it's not necessary, right? But this is a way for the, I'm trying to think of it's the program or the operating system. The operating system has to support it. Right? But it's a way to say, hey, this memory is read-only memory. It should never be written to. Right? When would that be useful in just in day-to-day -day programming? Yeah? Uh, probably for the scope. Defining the scope of the variables. Which scope specifically? Whether that's global or... Yes, exactly. So global, right? So global constant variables you can put into memory that's read-only and you can never write to it which helps guarantee that your code is never going to alter any of those programs, or any of those um, uh, memory, yeah, not programs. It is all just bytes, OK? Uh, so some of the permissions you can have are bits that say, hey, this, is, uh, this section is part of the program. Uh, you can have, you can say that, OK, this is not actually space in the file. There's nothing in the file, so you don't have to load anything in memory, but this memory should be mapped. So at this memory location, this is some global memory, but it's uninitialized. We have sections for the symbol table and the dynamic symbols. So the symbol table specifies strings, 
and it says what kind of symbols we have in our code. The dynamic symbol says this is what we're going to use, or it represents how to link up that dynamic linking. Um, we have a string table that specifies how to match IDs, identifiers, with symbols. Uh, relocation information that contains all the information that the linker needs to handle relocation. And so the flags, the flags specify the permission. So we have alloc, so the section is actually allocated in memory. Uh, write is the section is writable, that this uh, section is writable. Uh, execute, that the section is executable, and there should be a readable, but I don't think I have that back. Uh, and there's a flag that should say that something is readable. So we can look, and if you look, you can actually use the read elf program to read out all these segments, so it's actually really interesting to kind of look at this. Um, so this is just kind of a generic or typical version of an elf file. So usually the dot text name of the section will be the program's code, and so the type, it's programming bits, so it's code or data of the program. Uh, it has alloc allocate and execute, so alloc because that memory should be created in the program and it's gonna be executed. Uh, dot data is initialized data, which is gonna be allocatable and writable. Uh, RO data for read-only data, so we have a read-only section, uh, which is just allocatable. The BSS is uninitialized data, so what's the difference here between the read-only data and the BSS? It says no bytes and broken bytes. So, so what does that mean? So is BSS like uh, blank space? Exactly, yeah, so the idea is we don't know. So this would be global data that's uninitialized at the start. Right, or it could be, I think if the heap starts in there. I think the heap may be another one, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, right, as opposed to read-only data, so like all strings in our program, right, the compiler can take those, well, actually that would probably go into data. Uh, if we have some constants, right, those will go into read-only data, and so we know what that data should be, right, it has a compile time value, an initialized value, whereas in the BSS, it doesn't have any initialized data. Yeah. If we did have a read flag, would you have the read flag on for the read-only data and off for the uninitialized data? Uh, you would need it for both because your program will need to be able to read the contents there. Uh, actually, maybe that isn't a read flag. Maybe I'm getting it confused with approaches that have tried to add read flags. Oh, okay. I have to look at it. But, um, it may seem like a I think we'll get to it much later, but it may seem like a pretty <coughs> crazy use case, but there are some cases where you actually don't even want to, for security purposes, you don't want to read, you just want to be able to execute, let's say your code segment, you never actually read from it, so you don't want to do that. So just for comparison, the PE file format, uh, <coughs> it was introduced, uh, anybody know the limit on COM programs? Windows? Small. Small. 64K. 64K, yeah. Uh, so then they were like, okay, well, 64K is not big enough for programs, <laughs> right? Uh, so this is, when you have a Windows program that's an EXE, it's, it's not a binary, right? It's a PE file format, right? And the idea is just like ELF, it contains all the information necessary for the operating system to load that into memory and execute that program. So PE is different uh, because the programs in the PE format are written as if they were always loaded at address zero, right? So that's, so you don't specify an entry point, right? Because it's known that the entry point is gonna be zero. Um, but because of this, there's extra information so that the program can actually be loaded at different points in memory. So it can, act, that's with the, uh, And this is because of the header, so this is what I was going to say. Did my thing go out? Yes. All right. Battery problems. All right. So this, so this is why the header has to contain the information so that the code can be 
So why do you have to do this? Why do you have to fix? Uh, if the code's written as if it's everything's executing from address zero, why do you have to have additional information to change? What was that? What about jumps? Oh, wait, just a second. Yeah, so depending on how we do jumps, right? So some jumps can be uh, offset based, right? And say just jump four instructions down, right? That wouldn't be too, too big of a problem. Uh, but if we want to jump farther than that, right? We may want to jump to a specific address. So if my jumps say, hey, jump to 10, because I know absolutely from zero that's where I'm going to go then now that doesn't work if we relocate from zero down to somewhere else. So we need to know to update those jumps. Uh, also calls, so if we're going to call a function and we use its absolute address on this zero-based system, we're going to need to know to change that. Let's see if this works. But don't we hey, use there we go. stack pointer for that? No. The short answer. Uh, for some things we do. For local variables, we use the stack. Uh, but for global variables and so global variables and uh, calling functions, you use uh, more or less fixed, fixed addresses. OK. So who has experience coding x86 assembly? Cool. All right, the rest of you, there's going to be a crash course in x86 assembly. So it's fun. Throwing on like everything. Okay, so x86 has a long and complicated history, which kind of manifests itself in the, uh, the architecture itself. Uh, so it's kind of started off as a 16 bit for 16 bit, -bit processors, so that 86 comes from the 8086, uh, which I can't say I've actually programmed on. Um, then additional modes were added to it, so additional, we'll see what the protected mode and the real mode is in a second. Uh, then they upgraded the 32 bits, so let's, so we talked about the size of addresses, right? But why is this such a big deal, moving from 16 bit to 32 bit? More addressing. Yeah, right, we can address instead of two to the 16 bytes of memory, we can address two to the 32 bytes of memory, right? The same reason going to 64 bit is so nice we get access to a wider range of memory. Uh, further feature, features, added new features, added faster speed. Um, there are multimedia extensions that were, that were added, right? So x86 didn't really remain constant. It is continually being added to. Why do, they, why do they add things to these? Shouldn't we just like say, bang, stick with x86, never change it so that all programs are going to be backwards compatible? Third party? Third party in what sense? Some like different vendor devices. Different vendor devices? Mm. Close. Mm. I think you're, what was that? Another way is to just shove something into the processor, right? Make the processor make it fast, right? It can do things um, in parallel, right? A lot better than a program can. It can, you know, complex things are happening in hardware, right? It's going to be a lot faster. Uh, so this is why we can put like multimedia things in there, right? Or we can put security encryption into the chip, right? So hopefully it'll be faster to speed up our programs. Um, Anyways, so there's all kinds of, of additions. The SSE allows you to do multiple, like, compute on multiple sets of data, right? So you can have, so that's the other trade-off, right? So if you have, uh, you can make your program execute faster, 
Or if you can shrink down the size of your programs, you'll make the program faster, right? Even if the instructions still take the same time because of caching and everything in the system, right? Uh, smaller code that does the same thing is probably gonna be faster. Um, all kinds of stuff with hyper-threading, and now we get into the point where we actually have kind of hit the limit on how fast we can make the actual cores, right? How many people will have like 3.5 gigahertz CPUs? Fortunately, not anymore, right? I kind of missed those. Uh, but I don't know, maybe they are actually faster now. Uh, I'm not an expert. But the problem is we hit a point where our chips are generating so much heat Right? that we can't just make them faster and make them do more things per second, but we can take advantage and do multiple things at once. Right? So then it's, okay, with this continually decreasing transistor size, let's try to throw more cores on the die, so I have independent processors on one CPU. <coughs> so what does Moore's Law state? Yeah, I guess you can't even remember the exact yeah, he, 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 Two years? Ooh, sad. Um, yeah, so the idea is one of the, I guess a lot of you probably know, right? The, core, the key thing there is it's not, people used to think of it as the speed is doubling. Speed of CPUs are doubling every 18 months or 24 months or whatever it is. But it's actually about the number of transistors you can fit into the same space, right? So it used to mean that that caused a speed increase because you could just do more things faster because the distance between the transistors is smaller. I don't really know, I'm not a hardware person, right? But at a certain point, you can't make things faster because you hit heat. For every time you try to go faster, you generate more heat. And so what they've had to do, so this is why now they still are getting the, the transistors smaller and smaller, right? But they can't really make it any faster, so they add more cores. Basically, they've given up and saying, like, okay, software people, you've got to code your, your application so that they take advantage of this parallelism, right? Not just, you used to be just buy a new chip, you go from a P2 to a P4, and it feels like everything's screaming, mm -hmm. right? Because it's executing so much faster. Now you get a new chip, and it's like, oh, it uses less power, so my battery lasts longer, which is good, but I'm not going to complain. So it's not quite the same. All right, and then we got into 64-bit <coughs> architecture, with, which AMD first released, and then Intel adopted, so they actually use the same architecture there. Okay, so now we're talking about memory addressing. So what, do I, what does it mean, memory addressing? So like, sir, ma'am, doctor, professor, address. <laughs> Page table? Kind of, actually, yeah, I think that gets into it. What's that? Lookup table. Say it louder. Lookup table. A lookup table. So yeah, how do we, how do we access memory, right? It's one of the kind of fundamental parts of our program, right? Our programs do computation over data, right? Essentially, so the computation part's pretty much in the code, right? But then, how do we get to that data, right? We want it to be in memory. We want it to be in disk, whatever. But we need to access memory. So because it's 32-bit, right, we can access memory, of, we can access two of the 32 bits of memory, all the way from zero to, I don't know how many Fs it is, FF, 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 FF. all right, eight Fs. Right, and so the question is, so what does that mean? When I access this memory, right, what does that mean? So with a flat memory model, Basically, it just means our program sees memory as a single, contiguous thing from zero to two to the 32 minus one, or four gigabytes of data. We can just access whatever the heck we want everywhere within there. What's the problem with that? Yeah, right, so processes interfering with other processes. Um, it depends on if there's any process protection or memory protection, but if we think just, okay, everybody has access to raw physical memory, right, then what happens when processes are actually executing over and on top of each other? So the idea is, it also gets a little bit more difficult. So how do you, how do we implement these things like 
writable or not writable or executable. But who I can access everything, right? So then the OS would have to check basically every single memory access to understand is it within this, does it have these proper settings on it, right? Or maybe the hardware then has to support that. So it makes things more complicated. Uh, so the idea is they said, okay, this is actually kind of crazy to do this. So let's, what they call, we'll, um, we'll segment the memory. So instead of treating memory as one huge contiguous segment or one huge flat memory space, we're going to separate the memory into different segments. And then each of these segments, then we can address them separately. And then we can, the operating system can use these segments to know exactly what's being accessed and to access the memory. Yeah. So what if you have maybe two bit machine, but you don't have four gigs of physical memory? Yeah, exactly. It'd be a problem, right? Every program would have to handle that correctly, right? Or they would have to have a handler for when they tried to go. And then you'd have to establish a standard of, well, does memory start at zero or does it start at FFFFF and work its way up, right? Uh, obviously, zero down would probably make most sense, but, but yeah, it'd be a problem. Like, you know, that needs to be specified somewhere. Okay, and so the other memory model is this real address mode model, which uh, is actually how things used to be. So this is actually kept around for compatibility purposes. Uh, so your modern processors right now, if you're running an x86 processor, when it boots up, it boots up into this real address mode. So that way you can actually still run DOS and older operating systems that run in real address mode. You can still run that on your modern CPUs. It was all crazy backwards compatible all the way back to the original 8086. Okay, so this is kind of how the different models line up, right? So a flat model, we just have a address space. But in a segmented model, I have different segments, so something tells me which segment I'm talking about, right? So this, let's say register or whatever, tells me, okay, which segment am I trying to address? And then this register tells me the offset. And then that maps into a segment, and then we get into page tables, which I don't think we'll talk about too much, but that may be mapped then to a different part of actual physical memory. So the program actually has a different view of memory than the physical memory that the kernel sees. So what's the benefit of the segmented model versus the flat model? Uh, as you said, giving permissions to sections about read write takes much less uh, space. That's one. Mm -hmm. What about memory allocation? It's yeah, so I can, I, I can uh, maybe allocate at the segment level instead of giving the program the whole four gigs, right? And so I may, and this way I can actually maybe control or have a handle on as the operating system how much memory a program's using. Uh, what about how much memory, so how much memory can I access here in this flat model? Two to the 32, right? Mm -hmm. What about here in the segmented model? It could divide it with the offset. Yeah, so if the offset is 32 bits, right? Mm -hmm. And the segment selector, who knows, we got 32 of those, right? You can actually allow the program to access more memory than just two to the 32, which is actually originally how this came about is with 62 bit, or 62, it doesn't make sense, 16-bit applications. So in 16-bit applications with a linear model, you can only access two to the, two to the 16. But if you want to use more, they introduce the segmented model so your program could access two to the 16 times however many segment selectors. Mm -hmm. So you actually access more segments and more memory. What's the downside of this segmented model? Harder to manage all. Harder to manage what? All the segments and... Uh, From whose perspective? So maybe as the compiler writer, or if you're writing by hand, right, the developer has to keep track of both these things, like segments and offsets, and you have to keep track of which segments you're using. 
It also can make it harder to analyze this code because you're dynamically calculating offsets and so, uh, selectors. You're also doing extra processing here, right? For every memory access, somebody has to do this addition of segments plus offset to get the actual address from memory that you want, right? So that's going to add some kind of overhead, right? So, thanks. Just showing that you don't get anything for free, right? Everything has some kind of cost. Okay. What are registers in general on a CPU? Yeah. Um, small words of memory, very fast. Like. Yeah. So they're, you think of them just as like bits of memory, I mean, bits or places of memory that live actually on the chip and are <coughs> incredibly fast to execute or to access, right? Um, and this is. And in most assembly architectures and languages, right, you can actually only do computation on registers, right? You can't say, okay, add that memory location to that memory location, right? You have to first bring in the value from memory onto the register, then do some execution, and then save it back into memory, because if something stops or whatever, that value is just in your register and your CPU, and it goes away. Um, in some sense, you can think of them as kind of local variables of the processor, right? So the processor has its variable that it's executing on, and this is how it's done. Um, so an x86, so how big are the registers? There's like five answers, I think. Yeah. It depends on the architecture. So if it's a 32 bit architecture, then you have 32 bit. Yes. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to talk about only 32 bit from here on out, pretty much. Um, so, yeah. So, pretty much everything's going to be 32 bit. So, the registers are 32 bits, right? Because they have to hold addresses, which are 32 bits, right? So, that's how everything kind of follows from there. Uh, we'll see some backwards compatibility stuff with 16 bits. Um, and then for 64 bit, obviously, the registers are going to be 64 bit. 64 bit registers. Um, so, the registers on x86, there's four general purpose registers, which means you can kind of use them for whatever. Uh, EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. Uh, so, a couple things to note here. We'll look at it in a sec. Oh, we'll get there in a second. Um, so, the AX is the 16-bit way. So, in 16-bit, they were AX registers, BX register, CX register, and DX register, which I see that's not a D. Um, right, so the E stands for extended. So it's extended from 16 bits to 32 bits. So that's how you know you're referencing a 32 bit register. So convention, conventionally, right, which is not I mean, it has to be this way, right? The machine will absolutely execute no matter how you use these registers. Uh, a is the uses the accumulator, right? So an accumulator, you're adding things to, you're changing, right? Uh, EBX is usually a pointer to your data. What's a pointer here at this level? The address. Yeah, exactly, right? So it's just inside EBX would be the address of whatever memory or data that you're computing on. And then ECX would be your loop counter, and any IO operations kind of happen with the EDX register. So the EAX register, 32 bits wide, right? Contains 32 bits. So important thing to know, while you're writing x86 assembly or when you're reading x86 assembly, if you see a reference to the EAX register, it means all 32 bits of EAX. If you see a reference to the AX register, right, it's just the lower 16 bits of, AX, e, of the EAX register. So this is why things can get tricky if you move, if you're comparing AX with zero and there's something in the higher bits, right, they're ignored because it's only these 16 bits. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind while you read code. Uh, this is split into the AH, so 
So the A high byte mm -hmm. and the AL, which is the A low, the low byte. And the same with all the other registers. So there's other registers uh, like ESI, which I can't remember what the SI stands for. Off the top of my head. What was it? Single Not single instruction. Doesn't have to do with the stack. The stack pointer. I don't remember. I'll have to look it up. Yeah. Segment index. Yes, segment index. Yeah, that's right. It's used for the segment stuff. Good catch. All right. And so. Just the same way, right? You can reference the lower 16 bits with the SI. <coughs> okay. And oh, yeah, here's where we get to it. Ha. Oh, not the segment. Close. Close. All right. Source. So when we're doing, I don't know, high speed memory transfers, ESI is the source and EDI is the destination. And there's also other special purpose registers. So, like we said, ESP. So SP stands for stack pointer. ESP stands for extended stack pointer, the 32-bit stack pointer. So this points to the address of the stack on our program. So we'll look, we're gonna go really into depth about how the stack works on x86 assembly. But it's important to note that this is, it once again is convention, you actually don't have to use it like this, but we'll see there's instructions that automatically implicitly use this stack pointer uh, register. And EPP is the base pointer, so which is also known as the frame pointer. So this points to the current functions, the currently executing functions frame, which is going to be on the stack, and we'll see how this is done. So the frame pointer is how all of the local variables and parameters of a function are accessed. So they're all different offsets from the base pointer, which is, allows local variables to be to have multiple invocations on the stack at once because each function frame, each function has its own local variables and parameters. But they're all the same offset from EDP. We'll see that too. Okay, so, so these are the segmentation registers. So these registers uh, we can use to select different segments. The CS is the code segment, DS is the data segment, the SS is the stack segment. Not 100% sure exactly, I can't remember. Extended segment, I can make up stuff, but I'm not going to. Um, any, the E flags register is constantly changing based on the instructions that we execute. Uh, so things will be updated in here as we'll see based on if we can do the compare instruction to compare two, uh, two registers together, then the E flags, a specific bit will be set that says, hey, they're zero, or hey, they're less than, or greater than. Uh, instruction pointer. Incredibly important. What's the instruction pointer? Yeah, it points, it points to actually not the currently executing instruction, but the next instruction in memory. Uh, and another important thing is we can't read this or set it explicitly. So, so, um, so how do we modify it? How is it normally modified? Who modifies it? Say no jump instructions, I'm just doing some executions. So is it changing if we don't have any jump instructions? Yeah, it better be, otherwise we're not executing any code, right? So who changes it? Uh, the EIP is essentially the program count. I guess what are the two possibilities? If it's not us, OS. Not the OS actually isn't executing at this point. It's just us on the, the CPU. Architecture. Yeah, the, the CPU is actually changing, right? So part of the x86 architecture, uh, what it does is it, so going back maybe to your architecture days, right? You have like the instruction fetch and instruction decode cycle, right? So as part of that, it fetches the instruction, the next instruction from memory. It decodes that instruction. Part of that decoding process tells it how many bytes that instruction is. And then by the time that executes, it's going to update EIP with EIP plus the size of that instruction it just decoded. Um, so 
So this is why, so x86 is not a fixed length architecture. It's not like a risk style thing like ARM. So the size of an instruction could vary from one byte to, I actually don't even know, to like a lot of bytes. Um, so, but you, the programmer, can implicitly control this, right, by calling jump instructions or call or return instructions, right? So this is a way that you have to manipulate uh, the instruction pointer. <coughs> A little trick, which may come in handy later, is that you can actually read EIP by executing a call instruction. So a call instruction, as we'll see, the semantics are jump to this address and push onto the stack what would have been the next instruction to be executed after this call instruction. So after this, on the stack is what that next value would have been. So you can implicitly read it there. And there's a whole bunch of other stacks for floating points and all of the NMX and the uh, SMM mode. I don't know, there's all kinds of crazy registers in there. Uh, but the main ones we'll use is the, the normal kind of EAX registers. Questions on registers? Cool. All right, so let's look at the E flags. So this is that register that I said, right? It's 32 bits. We know that. It's the has the current program status. And so each of these bits means, means something. Uh, yeah, so the zero flag will say if the thing, when you do a compare, if it's zero, and then branch or jump if zeros instructions will check the value of this bit. If it's one, it will jump. If it's zero, it will not jump. Uh, all these kinds of stuff, tons of stuff. Flags for overflows, if you've done an addition and the value overflowed a 32-bit number, that flag will be set. All kinds of cool stuff. So why is it important to talk about that? Oh, question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the reserved bit positions do not be good. So it says it always set values to produce the What? Why are they there? These values? Yes. Future proofing, probably? Just in case, like there's only so many control <coughs> bits that you actually need for your programs, right? And so I would assume this is just a way for them to reserve things in case they need it in the future. Any? Yeah. I'm not 100%. I, I mean, that's definitely why. It could also it could be that they're used in different contexts. I mean, maybe. Or maybe in the OS they get more bits uh, because they're operating at a lower privilege level. That could be. But yeah, I mean, the direct bits here don't really matter. It matters uh, to know that they're there, and that's this is how they're used. All right. So data sizes. So what do we mean by data sizes? Why, why do we need to talk about data sizes? Isn't it obvious? What do I mean by data sizes? Yeah, so uh, we like to think about things in terms of architecture, right? Of words, bytes, half words, double words, right? We can talk about those for pretty much any architecture, but how many physical bytes and bits each of those things are can actually vary between architectures. Right, so x86 we define, you know, a byte is eight bits, a word is two bytes, a double word is 32 bits, right? And so you have quad words and double quad words, anyway, it's kind of crazy. Um, okay, last thing I'm gonna end on right now. So, you must beware of the endians. Uh, Intel uses little endian ordering. So what does that mean? What is endian this? Yeah, so it goes back to the data sizes, right? Like for a word or for a double word, where is the most significant byte stored and where is the least significant byte stored? So for instance, if we wanted to store the double word 03020100, and we wanted to store it at 
address 00F67B40, right? What is at 00F67B40? Is it 00 or is it 03? Actually, zero, 00. So we'll do zero, 00, and at 41 is going to be the byte 01, and at 42 is going to be the byte 02, and at 43 is going to be the byte 03. If it was big Indian, these would be flipped around, which actually makes it crazy when you try to look at these things, and we'll see exactly why when we get closer to some exploitation things. Uh, but this can, if you're not careful and you're not paying attention, this will come back to bite you because you'll try something and be like, doesn't make sense. Why does it work? And you look at it and you see all your bytes are swapped from how they should be. It's an endianness problem. Uh, how are integers signed to integers stored? What does two's complement notation mean? It's like, hello, two, you're looking good today. No, bad joke. Yeah, so we flip all the bits and we add one. Right? This is how they're stored. So negative one is stored as all f's. Negative two is this. What is this number in two's complement? <coughs> I don't know, but you should have a calculator. <laughs> Figure out how to use like program mode on your calculator on your uh, laptop. 